。薄いのはほ。Welcome to Shoujo and Tell, where we discuss shoujo manga and tell who's hot and who's not, talk about themes, and just generally geek out. Today, January seventeenth, twenty twenty one, will be Shoujo and Telling about the series Pet Shop of Horrors by Matsuri Akino. I'm your host Ashley McDonald, and I'm joined by Morgana Santilli. Hello, Morgana. Hello. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh! I think I've been ha- trying to have you on for like a year. Yes, <laughs> things kept happening. So yeah, you know, now we're here. Yeah, I think you originally asked me like toward the end of 2019, and I was pregnant, and the holidays were coming, and I was like, I can't, I can't do anything. <laughs> yeah, and then 2020 happened, and you、yep. know, we just delete that year, and, and here we are. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> But we're here. That's what matters. That's what matters. We're finally doing it. We're doing it.、Um, so Morgana, who are you? <laughs> who am I?、Um, so my name is Morgana Santilli.、Um, I am the former manager of Comicopia in Boston, Massachusetts.、Um, it's a comic shop that is perhaps best known for its large manga selection.、Um, and I was hired there because of my manga background, my interest in it, and I had been writing about it for a while. I worked at Comicopia for four years,、um, and I left to pursue some review writing.、Um, I am also a host of the Manga Machinations podcast,、um, the the newest、uh, member of the Manga Machinations podcast,、um, and I currently am the、uh, sales and marketing assistant at Yen Press. So it's been a very manga heavy. Past few years for me. <laughs> yeah, I've gathered you like manga. I don't know. Yeah, a little, <laughs> little bit, just a little bit. Yeah, but it's interesting because both in、um, you know in manga machinations is more of a seinen、um, podcast for the most part. We would cover a lot of seinen stuff,、yeah. and、um, Yen Press does publish some shojo, but I don't think is necessarily known for publishing shojo. So I don't I don't get to talk about shojo manga very much,、uh, which is. Probably my first love. <laughs> I know. So I was like, "Come on, Morgana, don't you want? To, don't you have all those pent up shojo feelings?" I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> lots and lots. <laughs> so we're gonna let them out today.、Um, all right. So this first section is gonna. We're gonna try to keep it relatively spoiler free in case anybody hasn't read Patch Up of Horrors and is maybe interested in it or hasn't read it in a while. You know. Mm-hmm. Some people are very weird about spoilers. I don't know if you don't want spoilers, only listen to the beginning,、um, and then we'll get more in depth and spoil all the things. All、I'll、right, a spoiler warning. So Morgana, you are the one who is very, very hyped for Pet Shop of Horrors, one of your favorite series. Yes, Do you want to give a, a plot synopsis slash general things people should know. It's not really like a linear story. Yeah, yeah, it's a weird one.、Um, so Pet Shop of Horrors is a. 90s manga、um, brought over、uh, to the U.S. by Tokyo Pop in the early 2000s,、um, and it's focused on the situations around this pet shop in Chinatown. In I believe it's supposed to be Los Angeles, and the proprietor of this pet shop is called Count D, and he is a Chinese man、um, who. You know he sells pets ostensibly, but in reality he、uh, kind of the pets kind of enact their own sense of vengeance or whatever the the pet new pet owner deserves. Right,、um, it's kind of a morality play、uh, type of deal.、Um, and throughout all this,、um, there is a detective named Leon Orcott who is trying to investigate、um, D and kind of what's going on in. You know, in Chinatown, all these weird things keep happening, and D seems to be kind of、uh, associated with a lot of them. And it's real weird. It's a real weird series. <laughs> so just like come right out and say it. <laughs>、uh, yeah, very very episodic. And, yes,、uh, can be gruesome, but yes, definitely. I feel like the horror in the name isn't like always too too ramped up. <laughs> no, and and one of the things I really love about it is that it's really really beautiful. I love Matsuri Akino's artwork.、Um, it's very you know '90s shoujo artwork, and I love that there is some like really gruesome scenes in and amongst this like beautiful you know these beautiful people. Like I mean, D is really gorgeous. All the pets are kind of.、Um, They're they're often、um, portrayed as human, and they're always really beautiful. 
so there's this really like high shoujo like aesthetic going on and these like really you know gruesome violent and uh terrifying things that happen sometimes um a, a lot of it's very fun and there's a lot of humor and there's a lot of um there's, there's maybe even i don't know if i want to call it romance but there's definitely some <laughs> i mean it's not not romance right yeah. like, <laughs> some like uh you know for the, for the bl lovers out there there's a little bit of kind of tension <laughs> tension yeah they're definitely like an actual family but like all yeah right. <laughs> like, yeah definitely definitely but that's one of the things i love um about it and and i think so i i bought pet shop of horrors when i was you know a kid 13 or something 12 13 um for the first time and i think i was so into it because it was something that was made for me as a girl to you know to appeal to me as a girl um but also had this edge to it that i i didn't feel like other stuff for girls really pursued as much uh certainly not you know western um comics or or cartoons or things for girls i mean the well okay this is the spoiler free section so i'm not going to say anything now but i'm going to say something <laughs> later um that really like made an impression on me but um you know, I, I think it really opened my my mind to the idea that like I there there are things that appeal to me, right? Like there there are mm. things that are um, beautiful and heartfelt and romantic and also dark and complex and uh, you know shoujo manga, right? Yeah, well, I definitely <laughs> think uh, Pet Shop of Horrors is something that we don't are not getting currently in our like sh current shoujo market. A lot of uh, yeah, yeah, for sure, getting a lot of like contemporary and uh, maybe maybe some fantasy, but like mostly contemporary. Uh, and I, I feel like in America, yeah, it just seems like these horror shojos haven't really taken off, and so we have a very like narrow slice of what's actually available in the shojo market, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, that that is one of my my biggest. Um, I don't know. I get sad about it a lot. I'm like, I just want horror for girls. I just want <laughs> lots and lots of horror for girls. More horror for girls. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. This is the crusade you're on. Yeah, it is. And part of the reason I like horror so much is because I like beautiful things, and I feel like um, manga does it, especially shoujo manga, of course, does it really well. Like mixes this beauty and horror. I like to bring up Junji Ito uh, when I talk about shoujo because Tomie is a shoujo series i think people don't realize that and he's got beautiful artwork and this marriage of beauty and, and horrible things is just like so appealing to me um and yeah more more horror for girls more horror for girls definitely I, like yeah gr growing up when this first came out in america it came out like mid 2000s i would have also been same age as you mm -hmm. uh like 14 when this first came out or something and it definitely wasn't on my radar at all. <laughs> just like, yeah, I was reading basic stuff like Fruits Basket and Bleach. I don't know. <laughs> <You> know <laughs> nothing wrong with those. Keeping it real basic. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing <laughs> yeah. wrong with that. I mean, I'd certainly, I also had a subscription to Shonen Jump. So, like, <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's important. Keep up with the times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's all to say. I definitely didn't read this until just now. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's really one of my, like, still my first horror shoujo's. The other one most recently was After School Nightmare. Yes. I've heard good things about that. I have not read it yet, though. It's That's oh. another one that's kind of hard to find these days, I it's think. It's pretty hard to find, yeah. Yeah. That one was less hard to find than this, <laughs> I must so. admit. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure I spent overall less money on that, yeah. Yes. I, again, I appreciate your uh, your efforts to make this happen. <laughs> making it happen i know I, was, I got really scared because i ordered some of them from thrift books but mm -hmm. they were all labeled like i was looking at the covers and i was like okay i can tell that these are the original and not the sequel tokyo yes but they were listed as tokyo like in the header and i was like don't mess it up thrift books don't mess it up. <laughs> they didn't so i was like okay. good good <laughs> yes playing. i had i had alerts for thrift books for for pet shop of horrors tokyo for a while i, I still don't have all of tokyo um, all of it that came out. Uh, I was like, yeah, they didn't even finish printing it, right? No, no. I think, um, I think that was the point when Tokyo Pop went bankrupt and uh, they could not finish it. It's only like missing two or three volumes or something. Something like that. Yeah, it's like really, really tragic. Like, <laughs> like, come on. It's like you got through. Yeah, like seventy five percent of the series. <laughs> yep. Yep. So. Yeah. So I mean, do you have an overall favorite? 
aspect of the series? Like you talked a lot about yeah, what, what you got into, or is that too spoilery? Do we have to like get to the spoiler section? <laughs> no, I think, well, I will say that like, I, I said it already. I, I really like um, kind of episodic um, stories like this. I like morality play type stuff. I'm a big fan of like the Twilight Zone, which I think has a very similar feel of like weird things are happening because people deserve these weird things happening in their life. Um, I don't know why I like these so much. It's just really appealing to me. Um, and there are a few other titles too. And, and I think somebody asked about it. We can bring it up later, but this, this kind of like episodic weirdness is harder and harder to find. And I find it really appealing mm. um, for some reason. I like monster of the week type stuff, I guess. I was really into like like those segments of Sailor Moon, like the like the filler arcs where it's just like like the Cardians, right? Like they're just like one monster after another. I love mm. that stuff. That's like I was like, yes, what kind of weird themed monster are we gonna have this time? This one's a sneaker. Like, great. Um, <laughs> you know, I <laughs> love it. You're like, this is the best. <laughs> yes, yeah, really into that. Uh, I love the the Cardian arc, especially <laughs> of Sailor Moon. Yeah, I really like the episodic stuff because I feel like it gives you like obviously some of them you're going to be like, meh, that didn't do anything for me. But then others of them you'd be like, I loved everything about this so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just it's just fun. And and I, I like when a series can, um you know, can have some serious stuff going on and some real like, you know, characters that you really feel for and, and you care about their background. But they can also just like take the time to enjoy, enjoy the world, right, that they've they've created and just play in that for a little while. So yeah, that's that's part of I, and, and honestly, I don't know. I feel like maybe Pet Shop of Horrors made me realize I like stuff like that because again, it was pretty early on in my like serious manga reading. Um, mm. You know, I, I was I had manga from before that, um, like Sailor Moon, um, but uh, I think it definitely like to this day I, I keep looking for things like Pet Shop of Horrors, um, and I think it really. I just it it filled a niche for me that I didn't know I had, you know, that I needed to fill. That makes sense. That makes sense. And it's also gorgeous. I really like it. It is very pretty. It's very pretty. <laughs> the the animals in their human forms are actually cuter than like yes yeah. them in their animal form. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure she's great at drawing animals. Actually, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the proportions. Reaction. I was always like, I don't know that that looks exactly like a wolf, but all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um. <laughs> No, I, I do like I like her artwork a lot, but she but she's particularly good at just drawing beautiful people. I was gonna say so many beautiful people. I also love that in one of the notes, I'm pretty sure she was like, I have to make up all of Dee's, you know, dresses and they're different every time. And I was like, that is really hard. That's yeah, that's a lot. it's a lot of work. And Dee is beautiful, and I love beautiful men. And I'm, again, it's I'm not sure if that was something that like is Pet Shop of Horror's fault? I don't think so, because I think I was watching, like, Yu Hakusho and stuff before that. Like, you know, beautiful... Bishonen are, like, a, yeah. a staple, um, but I love them. And uh, and D is just, like, stunning. So pretty. So pretty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I guess that's that's pretty good for the non-spoiler section, and we should move on. But I, I guess I'm, like, I want to acknowledge that, yeah, it, it's very, it is very hard to find the series. It was published by Tokyo Pop. There are actually multiple sequels. Yeah. We can only have part of Tokyo uh, over here. And so you can find the anime easily, but it's only four episodes. You yeah. For like $12. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's an OVA. I think it's also streaming on High Dive um, oh. if you're into the streaming thing. I am. I just always forget about High Dive. <laughs> yeah. I do too. I do too. But I, I'm pretty sure it's there or what it used to be anyway. I, I will say I am not as fond of the anime, partially because it's, I mean, short. It's just four, yeah. you know. I mean, and it's it's just like, a, I think it's just from the first volume, even just a couple of the, like, standalone things. It's just um, like all the first volume and that's it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, and it's just, you know, and, and this is a complaint I have about uh, anime adaptations somewhat frequently is like it's just not as pretty as the, as the uh uh yeah. as the manga i mean there, there it is appealing right in its way and it's like retro 90s uh early 2000s anime way um but there's something very satisfying about the texture of the manga too and all the um the screen tone i mean again it was like the 90s when this was originally published in japan so it's like lots of screen tone and like leon's got these like t-shirts and they always say some like weird thing in english yeah. on them that make yeah. no sense at all one of them was just like different fragments of like a newspaper or something. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Change each it. time. Yeah, I love it. 
Ridiculous. Ridiculous. <laughs> uh, all right. As your professional manga, you know, publisher, perhaps opinion, what what chance does this have of getting a reprint? Like, are people, do you think that will ever be like, oh, there's a currently running sequel, so there's, there's like, interest. Uh, Would we ever get all of these things? <laughs> I don't think I have any insight as a professional necessarily. I wish, right? Like I wish mm. people were, were into this sort of thing. Um, I really feel like it's the chances are extremely slim. And I think it's not necessarily because of the story itself, but because it's older and just, you know, I think it's, it's still under the radar. Um, it is, and it is weird. It's kind of a weird niche, niche title. And th- there are things, there are other series like this out available now. There's, um, let me think. There's uh, Nightmare Inspector by Shin Mashiba, and that's out from Viz, or it was out from Viz. I think it's still available. And there's Yokai Rental Shop, from also Shin Mashiba, that's published by Seven Seas. And actually, Yen publishes Phantom Tales of the Night. Um, and these are all similar things where you have like, uh, you know, a proprietor of some shop or service who is this kind of mysterious entity who has like a weird background and episodic things happen to various random people who come through their door. Right. Um, Mm. I love it. I love it. I love it. And uh, none of, I I like them all. I like all of those ones that I've mentioned, but none of them I like as much as Pet Shop of Horrors. (laughs) And, um, and I don't know, that might be just like nostalgia bias, but um, so it's not like there's, there's not some precedent for something like this. You know, again, Mm. there are other titles and horror is in right now. I feel like there's a lot of interest in in spooky things and yokai and 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 horror in general. But I just feel like you know it looks dated. Um, mm. And I think I think that works for something that's much older, right? Like something from the '70s. Like I actually just listened to your episode um, with Jocelyn Allen on Claudine, and like mm. I, I think that works, or like Rosa Versailles works because they're classic, right? Um, whereas something from like the '90s, it's not quite there yet. Like it's just kind of looks old. <laughs> we need to give it 10, 20 more years. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I wish. I mean, to me, it's a classic, but, <laughs> and I know a yeah. lot of people who like it. I know a lot of people who, you know, when I bring it up, they're like, oh my God, I love that series. That's the feeling I get from anybody yeah, who's read it. They're just like, it's the best. It's so good. It deserves justice. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, I wish it would come back. So, I mean, you know, for those of you who fill out the uh, publisher uh, questionnaires and things like that, just put Pet Shop of Horrors on there. So I'm not the only one who's... <laughs> Yeah, everybody Begging keep running in touch up before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I almost feel like it having sequels is a double edged sword, right? Like, yeah, because it's currently running, it's like, oh, there should be some more hype for it. But also, then it's like it's that much more to publish, and now it's like you know twenty, thirty plus volumes, and it's like that's a lot <laughs> to yeah. ask yeah. of a niche shoujo title. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I. Oh, man. <sighs> I don't know. Maybe one day I'll have to make it happen on my own or something. I don't know. Just like become a publisher to print one book. <laughs> 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 Just this one. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, the Pet Shop of Horrors publisher. <laughs> that's all they do. <laughs> yeah, that's all they do is publish all of them. <laughs> yeah, all of them. Every single one. Um, no, I know. I, I wish. I hope and I wish. But I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to. Um, I'm not surprised if it's never going to happen. <laughs> You're not holding your breath yet. No, no. All right. On that cheery note, we're going to go into the spoiler section (laughs) uh, in which we're going to spoil all their things. And I mean, yeah, there's there's some wacky stuff that happens at the end that you probably don't want to know about. So, you know, don't listen if you haven't read Fetch Up Wars. And, and, you know, God bless you if you can find it and read it all. (laughs) Yes. And if you want to spend a lot of money on eBay lots, like, People who are selling it in full are definitely gouging you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's really hard to find. Um, I was able to pick up some volumes that I was missing from, like, conventions, but we're not going to conventions right now because there's a horrible plague. Um, (laughs) So, you know, when that's available, again, you might want to, you know, look out for that. Thrift Books is a good way to find them, though. I, I I did find some that way, you know, and just hope that some somebody doesn't know what they have and is and puts it out there for like the whole series for like 50 bucks or something <laughs> yeah that, that would be amazing way cheaper yeah yeah uh yeah combination like ebay individual volumes press thrift books 
is okay, you're still going to pay more than like the base price of a manga, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, not too much. Um, all right, so I want to start off the spoiler section like kind of easy, <laughs> you know, before <laughs> we get into the nitty gritty of dark themes and things. Um, what are some of your favorite stories from this? So, um, when I was younger, I reread the first volume quite a few times. I was really into that first volume. And, uh, I mentioned earlier there, there's one story that really sticks out to me. And I think this was, again, this is the turning point of like understanding that horrible things, um, and beautiful things can exist kind of in the same space. And it's that first story with the birds, Paradise. Mm. And uh, there's a scene where, you know, the girl's not supposed to go in and, and watch the, the birds mating, right? Like, there's you have to leave right. them alone. And she opens the door and Pichan is there and his, like, his chest cavity, his, like, torso is completely open and his, like, intestines are spilling out and there's blood everywhere. And I was like, holy crap, this is amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and I'm, like, a teenager or whatever. Like, this is this is wild. I can't believe that, like, this is printed in this book. Yeah, um, yeah. And I go back to that that image over and over again, and it's it's. I mean, again, I'm a horror fan, so for me, I'm like, this is great. <laughs> this is just like, <laughs> you know, this is juicy um, and gross and sad. Um, so I love I love that moment. But I also, on a, a much cheer cheerier note, there's the story also in the first volume um, about the uh, blind girl who gets a seeing eye dog, mm. um, and he's a. Uh, you know, he's a former, like, uh, military, I think, dog. And he's, you know, he's got his ears cut and she, like, feels his ears or whatever. Um, I just love that, Idrizian. like... Idrizian, yes. I love that one. I thought, I just think it's sweet. You know, it, there's still, like, drama and violence in that story. But uh, the overall message is very sweet. So those those two are, like, they really stand out. And then, of course, you mentioned it, I think, in, in your your notes that I'm, I'm peeking at. But um, the stuff with Leon's little brother... Um, I was looking. I love him. Yeah, I was. I was looking back through that today, um, just to like prepare for this. And I had, I remembered, you know, who Chris was and what was going on. But there's, you know, he he blames Chris blames himself for his mother's death because she died giving birth to him because she was much older. And he's talking with the bird uh, who who appears as an old woman, and she, you know, she's telling him about you know her own baby who was stillborn. And um, and how like life is a precious gift and your mother would want you to, you know, to live your life, you know, to the fullest. And I have this thing now that I've become a mother where when I read stuff about mother child relationships in manga, I get way more emotional than I used to. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I always I mean, it was always emotional to me. Like I was always like, oh, this is really beautiful. You know what? a You know what a beautiful thing to say. And now I'm just like, it's true. <laughs> you're like sitting yeah, there like, you're like I feel it so viscerally in my heart now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So um so that really uh, yeah, there there are these like really poignant moments in what is overall kind of a I don't want to call it a trashy manga, but it's definitely like, you know I wouldn't call it a trashy manga. Yeah, it's like pulpy fun, right? Like it's it's like horror and and silly, you know, romance and whatever, but it's also like there's definitely some some poignant uh, moments like that that I think could be, I don't know, I feel like it could be cheesy, but I didn't feel, I, I like reading it now, I'm like, no, that really, like, I find that really meaningful <laughs> somehow. Yeah, no, I, I think I legit started tearing up at one of the first Chris stories. Like, that is one of the first Chris stories. Yeah, um, yeah I started tearing up at that story. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. Uh, and the image of him, I think it's the next story after that when Count D is like, you know, someday, because Chris doesn't talk because of uh, his cousin uh, telling him that he murdered his mom. That yes. like, put him in shock. And that's like the first time he learned about that he was adopted and all these things. And so he, he's in shock and he doesn't talk anymore. And Count D is thinking about how he's like, oh, uh, you know, Leon, his older brother, can't see uh, that all the animals have like a human form like he doesn't see he doesn't believe in these things mm -hmm. but chris is like they're human i don't understand why y'all think this is a pet shop <laughs> like yeah they're totally human uh so count d is reminiscing being like oh chris someday you'll have to like leave this world uh and it's like just him imagining chris growing up and like playing baseball it's like that's like one page and then the other page is just chris's silhouette running away from the silhouettes of all the 
animals in their animal form and that made me really sad <laughs> yeah like, yeah it's like the innocence of childhood will be lost um yeah yeah no yeah there's some real like some real uh heart tugging uh moments in this silly silly fun series in the series where you're like you're definitely making up the rules as you go along <laughs> yeah a hundred percent a hundred percent you didn't know Leon had a brother until you were like, I gotta spice it up in volume five. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel about that. I'm like, mm, okay. Yeah, yeah. But then but then it worked, right? Like it did work. She made no. it work. One hundred percent. It worked <laughs> awesomely. Uh because yeah, I feel like the first couple stories I was like, okay, they're pretty good, but I'm not like super sold on it. Then volume two with like even the silly like Vegas story with the guy who's like down in his luck and <laughs> and like homeless who who gets the little the, the cat who gives him all the luck and everything. I was mm-hmm. like, all right, I don't know for some reason I'm like getting really into it. <laughs> uh, and then by volume five, I was like, all right, I'm kind of like tired of this episodicness, right? But then Chris came along and I was like, Chris is everything to me. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess I know who your favorite character is. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, no. The answer to all of these questions that I put out, favorite character, favorite pet, there's all Chris. <laughs> <laughs> he is kind of like a pet, isn't he? <laughs> no, I love there in volume like 6 or 7. I have been talking to my partner. I was like, "Chris, Chris is a pet." And he just started laughing, being like, "Okay, I mean, I guess." And then I was like, "Um, it like I got to the end of the volume. I was like, "Um, excuse me, in this pet catalog at the back of the, each volume, he is currently the first one listed, so he is definitely a pet." <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yes, yes. Uh, he is really good, actually. And usually, you know, I feel like little kid characters or like little si- younger sibling characters can be a little bit saccharine sometimes, in, or or like uh belligerent i feel like chris is a good like you know i I actually like him he's like a normal kid (laughs) you know yeah he just like sure he has some fantastical moments but overall i'm like no he's still like an annoying kid right like he's like a crybaby he thinks his reality is the only true reality (laughs) you know (laughs) plenty plenty of things but i'm just like you're so adorable and you deserve better (laughs) (laughs) you just did um yeah but who are your uh favorite characters there's like simultaneously oh. only three recurring ones but then like a million bit characters to choose yeah from, right? i know it is really hard well i love i mean i do love d i like his his mystery i like that he's like not a bad guy but he's also not really a good guy like you kind of don't know what's going on with d but you care about him anyway <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean, there's a million things we could say about D. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, and and I'm sure we'll get to it. Yeah, I I really like him a lot, um, and I and I do like Leon actually. I think he's a he's dumb. Uh, he's a he's a. <laughs> I think Leon might be a himbo. I think that's the. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> he might I think, be. I think he might be. Um, I'm not. I'm not totally up on like. Yeah, I'm still learning how to use himbo correctly. Right? <laughs> um, but I do, and I do like their like weird relationship a lot, and and the way they play off each other. Yeah, I like it. My my partner was like, if I was gonna role play any of these people, <laughs> I would pick Leon because he's just he's so like he has a good heart, but he's just so one minded about everything. You know? Yes, like, he's, he's a real simpleton. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He'd be easy to easy to role play for sure just kind of like embody yeah yeah yeah. just pick the most obvious answer every single time Uh, (laughs) just like (laughs) just go with your gut just make it very and say it in like very masculine try to like be a character caricature of american masculinity yes (laughs) yes yep yeah i mean while we're here we might as well talk about d um yeah what is d what is D? <laughs> that is a great question. That's like Is he good? Is he bad? Yeah. Well? Yeah, I don't you know I'm I still I'm not sure. <laughs> I was like, did you have theories when you were a child like about what he like is? <laughs> you know, I think I just kind of I think, you know, when I was younger, the the kind of ambivalence of his stance was confusing to me. I wanted him to be good. I wanted him to be um, you know, the good guy. And as I, you know, have gotten older and have reread it, now I appreciate that he is more complicated than that. I I think overall he's good, 
you know, I think there's, there's definitely, but I think he is, um, I think he definitely has, uh, what's, what's, what am I, he's, 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 he's got dirty hands, let's put it that way, he's definitely done things that are, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, questionable, um, I think overall his, his, you know, uh, heart is in the right place, I think he cares about certain things, but he's, I mean, I guess, spoilers, he's not entirely human, um is kind of the the takeaway uh and he definitely has trouble like dealing with like human emotions sometimes you get to see that like in the later half of the of the manga he's a little bit like i don't understand why leon is this way or like or you know why you would um i, I was just flipping through i think it was volume seven where like leon's really like torn up because he couldn't shoot his like childhood friend who's mm. like a criminal or something and, and D doesn't understand like why would you you know why would you want to be in his place or like why would you like not you know do your job there's like a conflict there of like he just doesn't understand um yeah so I think like maybe not even like good or bad he's just kind of like not yeah I think like amoral is maybe a good um but 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 through the course of the series kind of leaning toward the good side of things um maybe because of leon maybe just because he has his own you know feelings about things he he develops his own feelings about things over the course of the series because it's clear he doesn't really care about humans so much um at the beginning he he lets the the pets do what they will right and and wreak their vengeance yeah. as they will um, and he always is like, well, that's just, you know, that's their nature. Yeah, like he he's giving pets to people that he knows like they're just exploiting each other in a way. And he's like, well, I didn't do it. Like the pet and the human chose each other and they led to like these terrible consequences. Right? Yeah. Like they broke the contract or, or whatever. Right, right. And he's like, I told them, you know, like it's it's not my fault, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, he has no like culpability, um, no sense of responsibility for those those outcomes. And it definitely, yeah, like it definitely seems like Chris and Leon are kind of his like like he's like I have affection for these two, and I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. This curious experiment we're having right here, right? Like, yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because when like when Leon first brings Chris in, he's like, "Oh, I can't." You know, Dee's like, "I can't take care of a child. They're wor- they're harder to take care of than animals. Like this is the yeah, worst." Yeah. And then over the course of like you know the day, he's like, "Oh, this child, he's so special. So <laughs> special. He can see all the true nature of all my animals. Like he's the best." Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I take him everywhere now. He's mine. Like yep. Leon, they like pay lip service to Leon being his guardian, but I'm like, he is always with County. Like, <laughs> yes, play with me. Yes. Oh uh, my goodness. He's always with mom. Really is. Yeah, the... he's always with mom. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know Leon's out there shooting up a bunch of bad guys. I'm like, this guy is only like 26. And he's killed multiple. Like I don't think police officers kill that many people in the line of duty. <laughs> I, you would hope not. Uh. You would hope not. Yeah. No. In some ways, reading this in the year 2021, I was like, all right, you know what? Yeah, there was the, in that Vegas story that I mentioned. They like talk about becoming Donald Trump, but you know it's written in 1995. And yeah. I'm like, this was too soon. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I can't yeah. This. Yep. Yep. It's uh, it's very interesting the the perspective of uh, like America that that's portrayed here, and and like like you said, like the you know twenty six year old police officer who's killed multiple people already in the line of duty, and like it's that seems totally reasonable and rational, and that's what police officers do, and it's like you know in in America in a city in America, and it's like no, not I mean no, they shouldn't be. <laughs> like, it's like, I really don't think, yeah, that, that many police, like, okay, it is in LA. Yes, and he's a detective, and he's de- and he's dealing with, you know, drug running and, and yeah, stuff like, like that. Yeah, like homicides. Yeah. So, I mean, to a certain degree, yes, there is going to be danger and risk, but, like, you're supposed to, you know, not shoot if you can avoid it. <laughs> yeah. Which I'm just like, no, Leon's not about that life. He's always like, shoot first, ask questions later. <laughs> yep. Because he's American. He's American. He's a he's good American. old American boy. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, I definitely, the portrayal of America 
was interesting. But I, I definitely think in the beginning of the story, it was in LA. I was like, I'm pretty sure this was New York <laughs> for vol- like three volumes. And then they were like, just kidding, this is LA. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, w- I remember reading it and being like, wait a second, this was LA this whole time? Oh, okay. No, I, I guess just don't think fine. it was. <laughs> I don't think that's true. Um, well, because I wonder, because like, you know, like like you were saying, there might be a little bit of like making it up on the fly. <laughs> yeah, in. no, because what made me feel that was that I think it's volume two or three where they go into the Natural History of Science Museum or whatever. Mm-hmm. To, and they have that like, you know, Leon's like, this is all it's the drug one where it's like it's definitely drugs. Right. Like the incense <laughs> is inducing yes, yes. things. I guess it was it wasn't fully the drug one, but yeah, like D was there to go pay respects to the extinct animals because he had just heard on the news that uh, another animal had gone extinct, so he was just like paying respects to them. Went into his like incest incense induced land, but then like Leon shows up because he's like D's doing something shady in the museum that's closed after dark, uh, and you know you get to see all the skeletons of like a T Rex and everything. And I was like, first of all, I'm pretty sure this museum is in New York. <laughs> Second of all, I'm pretty sure it's like legit just a reference to banana fish. Like just straight up a reference <laughs> yes. to this happening in later banana fish, like going into this museum and having a shootout. I'm like, but you know, whatever, sure. <laughs> it's LA. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. You know, that's fun. Uh yeah. No, I remember being like, I don't I don't think okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't. If you say so. If you say so. At one point they said it was San Francisco, which is even funnier. <laughs> yes, yeah. They don't know where they are. That's okay. They don't know where they are. That's okay. I don't care. As long as I mean, as, at the end, know. they're on a ship in the sky and Neon gets <laughs> yes. pushed back to LA. So, I mean, it's. A- <laughs> That's right. It's whatever. <laughs> it's whatever. <laughs> um, okay, but do you have a favorite pet who's not just, you know, a human disguised as a pet? Like uh, Chris? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the pets are very transient. So, it's hard to, it's hard to pin them down. Obviously, there's. Um, there's is it Q-chan, the little uh, yes. flying, I don't even know what he's supposed to be. But uh, he was a human. Oh, yeah. Or something. Or something. He's um, apparently Count, the real Count D. Yes. Count D's not even the main character's name. We don't even know. We, we don't, don't even know. Him. He's very mysterious. Um, I do like him, though. He's very, like, you know, he's cute. He's a little cute, cute. Oh, yeah. I love the part where Chris was like, wait, but the, the most valuable and cute animal here and weirdest is Kyushan and I was like oh dang Mm -hmm. Chris knows everything Chris knows everything um yeah I I do I like the um oh is it Tichan the yeah yeah he he like doesn't he try to eat D and then D like is like come stay with me you were just acting on your own nature and then like takes him in and suddenly he has this like horrifying monster living in his (laughs) his pet shop eating people yeah so Again, my, my partner and I had debates about this. He was like, I don't understand why Tetsu looks different. Totetsu mm-hmm. is, is the animal. It's supposed to be some like weird combination of a goat and like a man mm-hmm. <laughs> with a man face or something. And my partner was like, I don't understand why Totetsu looks different. Like he used to be an old man chef who wanted to like murder D. And I was like, I'm pretty sure the implication was that like, this is a baby version of that after that guy like tore out his own heart. He had a baby. Like <laughs> Yeah, it's like a, inside of him or something. Yeah, it's yeah. like a weird like possession sort of yeah, like birth. It's very strange. I mean, it's very like and and mysterious and like maybe you don't need all the answers. Just go with it. <laughs> Just go with it. And I was like, listen, Totetsu is the best. So like yeah. I wanna hear this. Like, yeah, you know? no, he's he's uh he's very sassy and I like him. Yeah, they're all fun. I I love the. Uh, I'm a big fan of like portraying non-human things as human, and like what would they look like as human? Um, mm. So I I have a lot of fun with the with the pets, but I do I do like Tetsu and I do like Kichan. They they have a lot of personality. I feel like yeah, I really liked. Um... Tenchan, uh, the one the the nine tailed fox that can turn like is what people see him to be. So that family mm-hmm. that adopts him, uh, uh, they all think it's a different animal. Like one of them thinks it's a dog, one thinks it's a cat, one yes. thinks it's a hamster. Uh, I think he's really fun. Yeah, that's that is fun. a fun one. Uh, and I remember the one, I think, 
the one pet that actually really scares me. There's not because I mean it's not like super duper scary horror, right? It's like yeah. ooh monsters or whatever. The one that actually legitimately scared me is the one, um, the rabbit, um, Alice, the daughter, where they like get oh, the yeah. they get the rabbit to replace their daughter and they spoil her and she like loses her mind and like starts eat like she like her belly explodes and all these rabbits come out and it's like that yeah, that one more killer rabbits yeah and like they're eating each other and they're eating the parents and like i'm like this is legitimately the scariest thing i've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> like this little girl like going crazy and just like and she's spoiled and she wants things and she's like awful and the parents just want to love her and give her whatever she wants because they lost and sad it's so sad and and then it's just like violent, and uh, and you know Dee's like, well, you know they didn't listen to the contract, and I'm like, yeah, oh exactly. my God. they didn't do what I said. How can I be culpable? In this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one. That's the one that stands out. So not a favorite, but like definitely like the scariest pet is the freaking rabbit. <laughs> mm. <Yeah. laughs> the thing you would not like, think of as particularly Nicola. scary, <laughs> just like a regular old rabbit. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. No, I definitely, as I was reading it, you know, I'm like, I'm reading it for the first time. Everything's new to me. It's very hard for me to do like deep analysis based on that. But I definitely started thinking, I was like, man, I wonder like if you can read it and, you know, put the animals into different categories. Like, you know, there's lots of dog stories, a couple of cats, like, you know, like leg legendary animals. I'm like, do they each have a different like thing they're trying to say? I'm like, there's many things. That's that's time for like an analysis book. That's not what we're here for. But that, that was definitely a thought I had. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, no, but again, my, my favorite pet is Chris. But yeah, if I have to name other pets, Totetsu and Ten. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's good. I, I agree. They're really, I mean, they're really all pretty creative, um, I think. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I think it's yeah. very impressive to have 10 volumes uh of like an episodic thing and i actually was still like always pretty gullible to the twist in whatever story right like uh maybe i'm just super gullible i don't know but yeah like i was like i'm still so surprised <laughs> i don't understand oh how is this happening to me yeah not too much reuse uh, of animals obviously the common ones get like dogs yeah. sure plenty yeah. of dogs there are a couple cats um yeah there are a couple cats yeah, no, it is. It is impressive. She she comes up with these like creative, weird situations. Um, I remember the mermaid really standing out to me too. That one is like a yeah, you know, because it's, it's on the cover right of the first one. There's like the mermaid. Yeah, it's yeah, like really yeah. beautiful um, cover and like it's such a terrifying. Like they're just like scared. They're just like I don't know. I think most modern people think of mermaids as like beautiful, uh, you know, ethereal Designers. creatures of the water, but they're like, you know, the history of them is not that <laughs> they are man eaters. Um, they're yeah. violent. And, uh, and I appreciate that. Like, and I think in Japan more so, uh, they, they do still treat mermaids as kind of, uh, scary creatures, so the Little Mermaid is very confusing to them. Is that? Yeah, <laughs> so, well, yeah. the traditional Little Mermaid, I think, is is much more um, is much more gruesome. Yeah. Gruesome, yes. Than I, she doesn't eat people, but uh, you know, yeah, There's still like actual gruesome things that happen. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it is it is impressive to be able to do that much um, creative work and find that many animals and you know tell tell unique stories with each you know you have a few with dogs or a couple with cats and you're still they're still different they're very different stories with, with yeah. those creatures uh i would like to say that my partner asher was like my favorite pets are all of the dogs because they are good boys and girls <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you <laughs> for this input <laughs> uh, That's fair. all dogs <laughs> so good I, try, I I really like the one where it was like, you know, Count D was like, these animals even are so silly. Uh, like, because the dog, I think it was the story about Daisy where she like really wanted to torture a little sister and she had the dog, but then was like, this dog is boring now and wants dogs. She tries to give it back to Count D, but then ends up picking the same dog again. She just doesn't realize it because now she sees them as human. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And County is just like, oh, dogs, so foolishly loyal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. 
Yep. And I was like, oh, that, yeah, that was the first story where Count D was like, the animals are the dumb ones. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Yep. D has very strongly held opinions and nobody is safe. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> nobody is safe from these opinions. Uh, his opinions are generally uh, correct. Uh, it's just like, uh, all right, you're just... You're definitely doing some bad things, <laughs> but yes. yep, yeah, you're um, D is a guy. He's quite a guy. <laughs> he's he's quite a person. All right, um, I do want to get to some listener questions and right. answer them directly. So, so this first one, I try to put them in somewhat of an order, but you know, what's what's order in a discussion? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first one is from at Draymora Dre on Twitter. Um, and you alluded to this a little bit, but maybe you have more thoughts, like uh, thoughts on the four OVA episodes corresponding to the series. I will answer also, are you covering the Tokyo sequel? To me, I would love to cover the Tokyo sequel, but I'm not in the business of doing things that are not legally licensed. Like I'm all for doing out of print things. Like that's fine. I don't care. Um, but I don't want to do stuff that like requires people to read a scanlation to, yeah. uh, yeah, you know, like enjoy the discussion so unless tokyo gets finished by somebody which seems very unlikely (laughs) i will not be covering it on this podcast yeah that's fair and you know i agree with your stance and i it's just too bad you know it's too bad that we can't um we can't do that uh maybe one day uh fingers crossed maybe it'll be 15 years from now who knows um (laughs) whatever (laughs) um but yeah, yeah, and in terms of the OVA, just um, you know, it's fun. It's it's a cool thing to watch. It's definitely to me not as satisfying as reading the manga, but I I'm pretty much always a manga person more than an anime person anyway. Um, I I much prefer reading manga to to watching anime. So uh, so there's that perspective. So you know, take what I say with a grain of salt too. But it is fun. It is spooky. Um. It's short, so it's not like it's going to take your whole life. It's like watching a movie if you want to watch all four episodes, you know, back to back to back. Like a fun fun thing to pass the time to get into the series that's hard to find otherwise. So. Yeah, yeah. I would definitely say that, like, if this intrigues you, there's no reason not to watch it, especially if it's, it's still available on High Dive. Yeah. I don't Do you have any thoughts overall? Like, you've read some of Tokyo, right? Like, do you have any... Is it you know, better? is it worse? <laughs> I, I honestly barely remember it. It's been a while. Um, like I said, I've, I'm trying to finish collecting all the ones that were in print, and I was going to do a reread once I had them. Um, and I only mm. have I'm missing quite a few. I remember liking it, and I remember. I mean, for me, it was just like, oh well, there's there's more. Great, you know. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, you're like it's like it never left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I could just I could just follow these characters. Um, you know, doing whatever they do because just because but i honestly it's been a while since i since i read it and i'm, I'm still trying to fill in the gaps um in my collection but yeah I, I remember enjoying it and and otherwise not not really not much i can remember other than that except that it takes place in in tokyo yeah so at Draymora dre also wanted to see uh like also curious to hear any favorite short stories in here okay we already did that and how it compares to other wish shop themed series you've read it's definitely got the darker tone of one mixed with different lessons at times. Um, I feel like you are you you already named some wish shop series, and mm. I'm like I'm much well like less well versed in this. The only one I could think of was XXXholic, which mm-hmm. did seem to be like inspired by this, but I've only read like maybe seven volumes of XXXHolic in yeah. like you know, like a decade ago. <laughs> yeah, I've only read one volume of that actually. Um and yeah, and it's very much like the same, um, you know, same deal where I read it and I was like, oh, yeah, I, I recognize this like, you know, this trope and cool. It's it's not as good as Pet Shop, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> like nothing is as good as Pet Nothing Shop is as good. I'm sorry, Clamp. I love you. But um, I'm sorry. I just couldn't. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't uh, betray D. Um, <laughs> uh, That's fair. Yeah, but yeah, and there and like I said, there are a few others, and they are good, and they're totally worth reading. They're pretty and fun, and um, but I I feel like I mean this is definitely I'm sure this is not the original, right? Like I'm sure there are yeah. other series like this, um, 
but it uh it really just it checks all my boxes it probably created all my boxes and therefore i have a hard time <laughs> checking the boxes with any other series <laughs> but uh but they're all but i do i do enjoy them all um because i crave more of this like weird supernatural episodic stuff i also really like um like mysteries and things and like the the whole um you know detective angle with leon even though he's a terrible detective um oh yeah he's is, terrible. he's really bad he's not a good detective but he's 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 a himbo um <laughs> I, I think we can safely say it um yeah. you know i do i do kind of like the the police procedural kind of thing um my opinions on real police work notwithstanding <laughs> uh, i do yeah. i do like myself a good detective type deal i felt like uh pet shop of horrors was pretty like self-aware about the like cops being bad <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. so, so i was like all right yeah curious <laughs> yeah yeah i, I want to know what what like did matsuri akino just like take this knowledge from like dubbed cop dramas that like on tv in japan or like where where is this like concept of american cops coming from and and i want to know more about about that research <laughs> yeah like leon seems like a very stereotypical tv funny cop but then i think the thing that's much more interesting is yeah like the moments where it's like oh but are like people hate cops and like yep openly acknowledging police brutality and all these things and i'm like okay i don't think you get that normally in yeah uh like th those types of cop shows i was like okay that's curious like like the community hates you and i was like whoa that's you just said that and like all right yep <laughs> <Very curious. laughs> okay yeah um so at nine eyes nine eyes on twitter I'm not sure how interesting of an answer we'll have, but uh, I'll ask the question. <laughs> what mm -hmm. legacy, if any, did the series help eventually inspire TV slash manga series, fan art, celebrity praise for the manga, etc. Uh, later in life? That's a great question. I think it really flew under the radar, at least in North America. Um, I think, you know, it, Tokyo Pop was printing everything. There were so many manga on the shelves. Um yeah. And that's that's part of their problem that they had at the time, um, and you know I think I think in in many ways it probably got kind of lost in the shuffle, right? And it's it's kind of niche, like it's this beautiful again, this like girls, it's girls horror, and and that's I think there's I definitely think there's a market for it, but it's not going to be as big a market as you know the fruits basket market or the you know Sailor Moon market. Um, so I think in terms of North American influence, I think maybe very little. Um, it certainly has influenced me <laughs> like, yeah, personally. Yeah. I'm not a celebrity, but <laughs> um, I care about it. I do think it has like a, a, a weird cult following. Cause like I said, every time I mention it on like Twitter or something, a bunch of people are like, Oh my God, I love that series. And I'm like, where, <laughs> where are you people coming from? Like, and, you know, it's people our age usually. Cause again, yeah. it's been out of print for a while. Um, and in my you know, anecdotal experience, younger readers of manga aren't super aware of what used to be out. Um, not, and not, it's not their fault, right? It's out of print. It's, it's like out of sight, out of mind. Um, so, yeah. so I don't know that it has like a lasting legacy in that regard, but you did mention like, you know, with, with XXXholic, you felt like maybe it was influenced by this. And I could definitely see that like this or things like it had an influence on, you know, the stuff that's coming down the pipe now um the, the other titles i mentioned and and holic as yeah. well like I, I feel like it's influenced things that have actually uh had a bigger impact uh, like on our current society right like we're like yeah. oh yeah clamp manga like obviously you're gonna gonna get licensed so, right, right right it was like a sleeper like it's, it, it almost like it, it didn't it didn't hit it big but it was like quietly working in the shadows like making this this genre happen <laughs> yeah in a similar way that i feel like uh i recently did haruka which like nobody knows about but i'm like this is what gave way to like visual novels like becoming popular and everything mm -hmm. like in japan and so it just took america like it was too soon for america to care about it right so it didn't take off <laughs> but now it's like oh everybody cares about this stuff right um so i feel like i feel like pet, pet shop of horror just might have been like too soon like slightly slightly too soon right yeah yeah 
Yeah, and to me, I feel like there's a gap in my knowledge. Like, even though I, I feel like I did my most natural manga reading in this, like, 2000 to 2010 period where it's like, oh, I'm a teenager. I'm just, like, exploring stuff, uh, figuring out what I like. Uh, I feel like now that I've done this podcast, I see much more, like, I'm like, I see how we got from, like, Banana Fish mm-hmm. and that interpretation of, of like, portrayal of bl to pet shop of horrors and its portrayal of bl Mm -hmm. uh but then i'm not as well versed in like contemporary bl and i feel like that's spun off so much from shoujo and i'm like i don't know how that 20 years has like progressed right to like yeah yeah and it's like influence you know something like banana fish or pet shop of horrors like banana fish i would i would class as more bl than pet shop of horrors but like both of them are kind of like not explicitly bl it's kind of like a weird like like you know and and i know a bunch of people who aren't into bl who you know were really into the banana fish to the anime that came out recently Mm. you know a couple years ago um which I still have not finished watching because I know it's going to make me cry. <laughs> it <laughs> already like, started cry making right me now. cry. <laughs> um, I actually haven't finished reading Banana Fish either. That's my confession uh, because it's going to make me cry. Um, <laughs> when I need it, when I need a good cry, it's I will fair. take yeah. it up um, because I do. I do enjoy it, and, and you know, it's it's this weird thing where it's like in the in the '90s, and I think Banana Fish was even late '80s, early '90s. Um, you know, they, these were running in, in regular shoujo magazines. I don't think they were running in like BL specific magazines. Right. Yeah. Um, but they still were. They still managed to get that in there. That like you know, romance aspect. And now there's like you know, there are magazines specifically for BL. There's there's stuff specifically that that's very obviously queer coded. You know, very obviously gay. Very obviously whatever. And then you have stuff like this that's kind of in this like, I like to call it like. Not technically gay, but basically gay. Um, yeah, like there's like this whole genre. Canon. Like <laughs> this whole genre in manga is like not technically gay, but basically gay. But like, how could it not be? <laughs> like, right, it's right. Possible exactly. not to read that. Right. Yeah. I feel like uh, there's there's quite a bit of clamp that falls under that category. I think of legal drug, although like I don't know, legal drug might actually just be 100 percent gay. I haven't read any of Legal Drug. Oh, it's that Legal Drug is another one of my weird favorites that nobody has read. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of these like weird, like, and a lot of them fall into that category of like not technically gay, but basically gay. It's a, it's a genre I really like <laughs> <laughs> because I think it- I was gonna say I think too like when I was a kid. Um, reading this stuff i wanted to read bl but i was certainly not interested in anything like i was not interested in explicit pornographic material right and like the the stuff that was available for bl was kind of even if it wasn't explicitly sexual was like really questionable in terms of like consent and like things that like it made me uncomfortable even as a kid like like looking at those things um like gravitation or something? Yes, yes. And yeah. I did have gravitation. I actually found gravitation at my mother's house recently and brought it all home. And I'm like, should I reread this? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't have all of it, but I have some of it. And I was like, oh. And now like, the anime is available on Funimation. And I'm like, should I watch this? I don't know. <laughs> like um, The other day I was saying, I, you know, I said to my husband, like, oh, I could watch this if I ever feel like I want some like gay nostalgia. And he's like, if? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, well, here's the deal. I do want gay nostalgia, but gravitation's weird. <laughs> like, yeah. And he's like, how do you mean? I'm like, I don't think I can even explain gravitation to you. <laughs> I don't even know how to start. Um, but yeah, but so there was a bunch of stuff like like that that was like, I, you know, this is this is BL, and I'm interested in that. And we didn't call it BL at the time. It was Shonen Eye or Yaoi, and like yeah. very specific difference between. Now I don't care. It's all BL. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't I feel like that's where we've come to yeah yeah it's just like just say BL it's easier you know and, and so I really wanted kind of just normal sweet stories about people who like each other right like people falling in love and stuff like this like like Pet Shop of Horrors where it's clear there's a relationship going on but we don't need to be explicit about it you can just have your fantasy about it like you can just like understand that that's the case um, yeah so so yeah a lot of my stuff falls into that that weird genre um and i don't remember how we got on this topic but (laughs) oh just saying that like uh yeah it's like 
in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, uh, BL oh, yes. used to be more like in line with shoujo, right? And then, yes. Uh, but now in the past 20 years, they've become very distinct genres. But like, I'm not really sure where that like kicks in. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know either. I, I'm not. I think even at the time, maybe in the 90s or like like toward the end of the 90s, I think maybe it was becoming more more explicit. Is my guess. I, I'm not. I like BL, but I don't. I don't think I would call myself an authority on it um, at all. Yeah. Um, but now, I mean, now there's so much more variety and so many more options. So I can I can get my like sweet romances and not have to deal with the explicit stuff if I don't want to. And if I want to, that's also available. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm still kind of like I would re- much rather read like nice sweet stories about romance <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or like yeah. or or just like adventures where like the characters happen to be gay that's fine too sweet stories like leon and dean <laughs> yeah yeah this, i guess sweet is not really the the term <laughs> they're always like fighting you're like you're definitely an old married couple like. right yes yeah it's sweet in that way <laughs> yeah. they're, they both care about chris and that's yes. why chris is great like yes chris is the glue that holds this family yes. together <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> my goodness <laughs> all right um at sparkling roses on twitter who is zara who is on the fishy yugi yembu kaiden episodes does the episodic nature of the series help with the quality of the storytelling or hinder it that's a good question and i think uh you were saying that you were getting kind of tired with the episodic um nature of it uh and for me i love the episodic nature of it so i think you know your mileage may vary right <laughs> yeah um, I think that like if you didn't have the episodes with the pets and their and their owners, there wouldn't be as much material, right? Like there is a story here, there is a through line, and there's stuff going on with D, and there's like some weird, um, you know, plot. But it's, yeah. it's not really plot driven. That's kind of just there. Um, if you didn't have the episodic situations going on, and if you didn't have Leon, kind of trying to figure out what was going on with D and like, you know, going into each of these, uh, these situations, there wouldn't really be a story at all. Yeah. I'm just kind of like, it's hard to separate the episodicness from like anything else. Like the episodicness is part of just what it is. Right. Um, I think also if it wasn't episodic, it would just be too hard to suspend disbelief enough for the plot, Mm -hmm. right? Like Mm -hmm. the quote unquote plot. Yes. Um, Yes. Yeah, so like you always need the these strange episodes with the pets to like be kind of obfuscating what mechanics exist in this world. Like it's still unclear. You're like definitely some drugs. Although they keep <laughs> saying no, they keep being like it's just normal incense, and I'm like, no, man, this is like counts. This is- Give me them incense. <laughs> <laughs> this is brain incense, guys. This is like yeah, some yeah, yeah. mind bending incense. I'm like, this is definitely drugs. Um, (laughs) uh, So, yeah. So, I mean, I just, it's very hard for me, like, doing this podcast sometimes. I'm reading things under an unideal timeline. And I think that reading Pet Shop of Horror slower might have been a different experience. Like, there's a lot that happens in each story. Like, and so when you just read it really fast, kind of like I did, it, it kind of comes to start feeling like you're like, okay. There were like two plot twists in each, in just like one one story, right? And it's kind of like, all right, it's becoming like convoluted and like mm-hmm. hard to follow a little bit. But and I think too, if you're able to spread out this series more, the episodic nature isn't as troublesome, right? Because you're like, yeah. you know, you read the episodes and then you like move on for to do something else, and you go back and you're like, oh right, the series, and you like you know read the episodes and it's like enjoyable because you're not, you know you're not trying to connect all the dots between each, you know, and there's not really dots to connect and like, (laughs) you're just kind of enjoying it for what it is right there in front of you. Yeah. Uh, So I really think, yeah, it just depends on, on you as a, like whatever you like in storytelling, uh, Mm -hmm. how much time you want to give it. I feel like the, the tragedy of our timeline is like, yeah, we just don't uh, really give time to stuff where they're just like I gotta get through this thing so that I can get to the other 50 things on my <laughs> to read list right oh, like yes. I uh, think this is the perpetual problem of anybody who likes to read um, <laughs> yeah. I always have like I'm always reading something and it's you know sometimes it's manga sometimes it's novels sometimes but it's like there's the constant like in the background like what else am I not reading right now 
Yeah, no. And I'm just like, oh my God, slowly ruining our brains. <laughs> right. really yeah, bad. for sure. Last question was from at Sewing Rose 11 on Twitter. Um, yeah, what do you think about the relationship between Leon and Dee as it unfolds? They married. They married. <laughs> they married. Um, yeah, no, I mean, there's definitely, I think Leon is completely clueless um, about his own feelings. And I think D is also kind of completely clueless about his own feelings, but in a different way. Um, D just doesn't have like human feelings. Um, <laughs> doesn't understand the human feeling of affection. Right. He doesn't know how to do. If- I think he is aware that he yeah. has those feelings, especially one of the funniest things with Chris is that Chris is hanging out with whatever some like mermaid fish thing that's in D shop. Oh, Philippe, uh, I think. Philippe, yes. <laughs> um, and Philippe keeps being like, oh, Count D is very affectionate for your brother, even if, or like re- really cares about your brother, even if uh, he won't admit it to himself. And Count D is like changing the subject. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. No more yep. talking about this. Yep. <laughs> Yep. Um I think it's a it's a an opposite attract situation. <laughs> They're like sure. very opposite people. <laughs> yeah, I I definitely as a kid and even re- rereading it as an adult, my whole the whole time I'm like, yes, just kiss. Just kiss. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I I waited for that payoff the whole time and it didn't Yeah, happen. it didn't happen. No. Not as such. No. Yeah, my my uh, partner kept being like, I feel like what needs to happen with these two is that they really just need to like, you know, do it once, need to have like a uh, sex, and then they need to like not acknowledge that they did that, you know. Like, <laughs> after they just like they wake up, they put their clothes on, and nobody says anything. <laughs> they yeah, never do it again. And that and that would just solve, I think, a lot of their problems. <laughs> no, really, yeah, no, I agree. It seems pretty good. It seems like a good. <laughs> I want to read that fan fiction. If you have that fan fiction out there somewhere, please send it to me. <laughs> Link it. <laughs> yeah, like let us know. Um, into it. Yeah, exactly. I think we were we were specifically talking about like how would you write like, a fan fic? <laughs> right. Yeah. Definitely. Like, mm-hmm. Exactly that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In general, I'm not quite sure. I would say I ship them though. You know, like. Oh, I do. You I do. mean, I do. Well, so. Yeah, I mean, I do because I feel like that the setup is there for it. Um, I do, I think they're both ridiculous and in some ways deserve each other. <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're both just kind of very clueless, but it would make me happy to see them happy. Uh, I also think, though, that the, the part of the appeal is that they're never going to you yeah. know, make good on it. And that's like the, the fun is like watching it happen. It's like how, you know, typically a romance ends when the, the couple gets together because there's nothing left, right? That the excitement is in the like, you know, the building the relationship. Yeah. Maintaining it is boring. Right, right. Which I, I don't necessarily agree with. I've, I've definitely read things where we have a maintaining relationship and it's great. Um, yeah. Romance exists beyond the first kiss, guys. Um, <laughs> what? Yeah, I know. It's Bananas. Wild. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think I think that part of the part of the fun is that, you know, you kind of know they're never really going to get together, but you kind of always want them to get together. So you're just kind of watching just for that. Also, there are some cool animals, but also when are they going to kiss? <laughs> like, yeah, well, um, I think it's fun to watch how close they can get. You know, like, yeah, they do just essentially become a nuclear family. Like, <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But without acknowledging that. <laughs> And that's also like um, kind of appealing to. Sorry, you, I think you can hear my daughter screaming in the background. Um, I can. <laughs> uh, cool speaking of families, people like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, you know, I. Uh, that's I think that's part of the appeal too. Is like I I like that dynamic almost more than I would like the romance. Um, it's just like here we are taking care of each other, um, being a family. Uh, it's like I was saying about like sweet you know sweet romances oh goodness sev so uh yeah no i i think that that's that's more appealing than than like the full romance happening uh that said i i again i'd read that fanfic (laughs) yeah you're like this is what fanfiction was for right exactly exactly 
Um, yeah, I, I guess I didn't fully finish the thought before, but it was I. I don't think yeah, D knows how to show affection. Like he has feelings, right? Yeah, and he knows he has feelings, but he does not know how to like be like, how do I just like caress Leon's face? You know, <laughs> <laughs> how do I make Leon understand that this cake that I'm giving him right now is is more special than the other cakes? You right, know, like, right. Uh, the only other thing I really wanted to bring up is, is the frequent theme of like what gets passed down through generations. Like really the overarching, mm, it's not plot, but like the thing that drives all of the stories, supposedly, <laughs> is uh, this idea that the you know humans have come and with their science and all these things they've like ruined the natural balance mm-hmm. of, of the earth and so all the animals are just there to like take vengeance upon these humans and then there's you know it gets more complicated because it's like well humans have also done bad things to other humans uh mm-hmm. like based along racial lines and all these things uh so it's a, it's a lot of quandaries about like uh, and you know this. This is where I think that D really struggles. Is that he's like, well, you have to let the natural order of things take place. But we see him be like, but I don't want this thing to die. Uh, and he's also the one that went on, I believe, at least two. Uh, you know, like not rants, but you know, he gave little speeches about, uh, you know, two wrongs don't make it right. Mm-hmm. So, so like, you can't murder your enemies <laughs> right. uh, to bring about justice because that's not how it works. <laughs> right. Right. Even if they murdered somebody that you care about. And I was like, man, this is really deep. And I do know that there are studies that show, I believe, that there actually is like tra- trauma that is passed down through generations of like, mm-hmm. this particularly like suppressed uh, races of people mm-hmm. actually does start to affect your genetic code. Like there is just like legacy trauma that can be passed down through our genes. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> We're doomed. Um, We're doomed. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a really interesting um you know, it's always funny with with stories like this where we're talking about like how humanity has has ravaged the earth or you know destroyed nature. I always sit there going, "Yeah, we really have. Maybe we do deserve to die." <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Um, yeah, and I don't really like, believe that, right? Like, I, I think there's there's mo- much more complicated than that. Um, but the, but there's a point where you know you're kind of like, well, you're not wrong, right? Like, there's there's definitely some truth here, yeah. and you know, and and are we responsible? for the things that our ancestors did. I think we are, right? And are we responsible? Mm. I mean, we don't want to live, we don't want to perpetuate a bad legacy, um, but it seems like it's very hard to break away, right? Um, right. And I think there's a lot of that going on too. And even D has some weird legacy stuff in his <laughs> like yeah. background, um, which I am not remembering very well right now, but I remember being very confused by a lot of Yeah, it. I was like, wait, wait, what did you make of the endings? This is the biggest thing that my partner is like, what is the ending? Though? Yeah, I, you know, that's a great question. I think uh, I'm not sure anybody knows. I'm not sure Matsuri Akino knows. <laughs> She's just um, like, it's not an ending because there's three other sequels. We just, right. we just throw that out. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, and D is kind of like, I mean, if I remember correctly, it's not really like established exactly what he is, just kind of. No. Yeah. I mean, they, he's referred to as like a, you know, a caretaker, right? Yeah. So, like, kind of like a god or a demigod or an angel type character. Um, definitely not human. Um, no. <laughs> not, not, you know, something otherworldly anyway something supernatural and and it's so weird like at the end of the series he gets very kind of like i don't know melancholy and aloof and i don't know it's like you build up this this like chatty cutesy relationship right between d and leon and then it kind of just you know the end like the end, <laughs> whatever yeah. um and like wait wait what <laughs> Um, yeah, no, the end is very strange. It's very strange. And I remember getting to the point, um, where we're like finding out about D and what's going on with D and then like going, wait a second. Dad is there. Yeah. His dad is there. His grandpa's there too as Kyushan. Yes. Yes. And you're just like, 
wait, what? What's going? <laughs> There's three of them. Okay. Now what? His what? dad dies and becomes a human baby because that's what he wanted all along. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's very strange. It's very strange. Um, I think. I mean, I I said it at the opening. It's a very weird. It's a very weird series. Uh, I love it in its weirdness and its imperfection. Um, but it's it's totally like it doesn't make sense. <laughs> and, and I think I think you just have to like lean into it. Like it's fine. It's fine. It's not it's just just yeah. enjoy it for what it is. There are no answers here. Only questions. Only questions. Lots only of questions. Only more questions. Yes. Um, which may or may not be answered in the spinoff series that we will never get to finish reading. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't know. For all I know, like, yeah, there's plenty of answers in there in one of them. And I'm like, I, I'll never know. I guess. Yeah. I'm going to have to, like, finish reading what was published of of Tokyo and, and like, get back to you and be like, okay, so this is the deal. Yeah, um, so tell me yeah, what's up. I still know nothing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This is probably going to be the answer. <laughs> You'd be like, it's still, it's just like... I kept thinking of Devil Man while reading it. I was like, ah, oh, yes. What I got out of Devil Man was that... Humans are the real monsters, and monsters are the real monsters too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, and I, yeah. you know, I like that message <laughs> personally. Yeah, yeah. It's like one of my favorite messages in media is like, humans are the monsters, and also monsters are monsters. Um, and we like monsters; they're cool. <laughs> yeah, and just like we all have to deal with it. Just like, yep. Yep. <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, do you have any other final thoughts or? Oh, I wish I could tell everybody to go read it. Um, good luck finding it if you want to read it. I think you should try. Um, if you if you don't want, I mean, you could try to see if your library has it. Sometimes libraries still have older stuff. Um, although at this point, I mean, it's let's see, the last one came out. I have it next to me here. Uh, when was the last one printed? Like English text copyright two thousand five. Two thousand five. Yeah, so this is this is 16 years old. Um, so it may not even be in your library anymore. But you can try. Um, God bless you. You can try. Uh, Just make a pet shop of horrors budget, okay? Just yeah, like- yeah. Make a budget, or um, you know, ask you know, ask publishers. I know, I, I know. Seven Seas does regular um, reader surveys, and I think Kodansha has done them before. Um, I yeah. don't know if Pet Shop of Horrors is originally a Kodansha. Uh, publication yeah so you know put some feelers out there if, you, if you're interested in something like this that's kind of weird and pretty and gruesome and strange it's it's a lot of fun i love it i you know and i i sometimes struggle to say exactly why i love it in sim in some, i mean i mean i said i guess i said why i love it um but i think you know it's bizarre right it's like a really weird a weird pick as a fave uh but it just it just it hit me at the right time right i think a lot of it was like i was i was a kid who needed it um i needed the weird horror beauty nonsense and it was there and it, it filled that niche and i think uh i wish there was more like it in english uh for girls specifically i mean there's de- again there's stuff like it there's there's these like wish shop type series as we talked about but none of them are this like sublime you know shojo high shojo like fancy i don't know even shoujo manga these days i'm I'm just gonna sound old now but i feel like even shoujo manga these days doesn't have like the same texture and and over the topness of the shoujo of my youth um which of course is not the same as the shoujo from before that but yeah you know i, I can agree with that assessment um yeah. <laughs> and i still enjoy shoujo manga um but i definitely when i like feel low and i really just want to binge like some shoujo manga i i definitely look to older like 90s 2000s god the 2000s is older um yep. <laughs> excuse it's me getting further and further away <laughs> i know i know um god uh you know i definitely turned to that sort of thing that i think younger readers now think of as outdated so you know it's, it's just got a special place in my heart and if you also like older shoujo manga uh keep asking people for it keep asking publishers for it i'll i'll keep asking publishers for it and and hope for the best uh yeah i, I think uh, pet shop of Horrors stands out above the crowd just for how imaginative it is like again coming up with all these monsters and like all these twists it's just really hard <laughs> but it yeah. does it really well it's very stylish everybody everybody looks really good um 
There's a lot of good good use of screen tone back when they still use screen tone. And now, you know, manga artists do everything digitally, I think. Um, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you just don't get situations like Leon's shirt that's newsprint in different it's different in every panel um yeah it's beautiful it's really beautiful stuff (laughs) bringing us back 1990 to 2005 i know all right well i believe this is the end of the episodes thanks for listening to shoujo and tell comments questions constructive criticism concerns uh, need to tell us how much you love Leon and County. Mm-hmm. <laughs> ship, ship or skip? Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Email shojoandtell at gmail.com or leave a comment on the episode's YouTube page. We're at Shoujo and Tell on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. Morgana, where can people find you and your work on the internet? Sure, yeah. Um, I'm on Twitter at Morgana Relina. That's M O R G A N A R H A L I N A. Um, I do have a website. It's mangamaven.com. I have not updated it in a quite a while because i have a baby and a full-time job now <laughs> um but hopefully one day i'll, I'll write there again i do do little re- reviews and um and rundowns on on what's going on in my life in and manga stuff yeah i think that's it yeah uh again you're just like really deep in the trenches of manga so like... super deep right now <laughs> it's uh it's fun it's uh you know, I think uh, when I was a kid, if you told me that I was going to be working for a manga publisher as an adult, I would have been like, no, really? That's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> I recently uh, found a diary where I told it was like 12 year old me writing and I said I was too old for cartoons. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, um, I think that uh, I think I'd be surprised. I don't think this is this is not necessarily what I planned, but I think it's I think I would think I was really cool. Uh so it's yeah it's been like fun. you're proud of yourself young yeah young you is proud of you yeah young me is proud of 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 old me um older me uh and and i'm having a good time so yeah people can also listen to uh manga, manga machinations, machinations. Right? yes please listen to manga machinations you can find us at manga mac podcast on twitter um we have the um website manga machinations.com and we have a tumblr manga machinations.tumblr.com um and an email address if you want to email us it's i think it's manga mac no it's manga machinations at gmail.com i hope dakazu is going to listen to this (laughs) and be like morgana you screwed up (laughs) Um, (laughs) go men (laughs) no no the the guys are great and and we talk sometimes we talk about shoujo too i i get i've gotten them to to bend to my whims a few times yeah like spread their wings yeah Yeah, no and, and, and they enjoy it they do they do like um breaking out of the mold a little bit and we have a lot of fun and good conversations there too excellent uh more manga podcasts somebody come compete with me it's truly like <laughs> that's what I'm waiting for. what's up <laughs> are you excited every time you see a new episode from us if so please consider leaving a rating on apple podcasts this will help the show reach more hearts or at least ears thanks again for listening we'll be back next time for some shoujo or jose series which i do not know yet uh Every time I go to plan this waiting for spring two episodes, I see that Kodansha has pushed out the last oh, no. volume or whatever, and I'm like, oh, you no. guys are torturing me. <laughs> oh no. That's the worst. I just really want to read Waiting for Spring, okay? I want to do episodes on it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll figure something else out. I don't know. Until then, bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye.